Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Jen Noina, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's event. I've worked in the government at the federal level, leading teams at the US Digital Service that help transform digital services across government, building capacity and technology and design, and championing a, us a user-centered culture. And currently, I'm a fellow here at the Beck Center focused on supporting the public interest technology workforce, creating pipelines for talent investment and skill building. At the Beck Center, we are a part of Georgetown University, and our focus is on reimagining systems for public impact using design, data, and technology. Our team comes from all sectors, with most of us having worked in federal, state, or local government. And our projects test new ways for public and private institutions to leverage data and analytics, digital technologies, and service design to help more people. Before launching into our conversation, we've got a few housekeeping items that I'd like to cover. So we are recording this webinar. If you miss anything or want to share what you learn, you can follow us on Twitter at Beck Center, and we'll share a link to this recording in the upcoming week. At the bottom, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button where you can post questions for our panelists anytime throughout the event. We will try to answer as many questions as we can later in our discussion. And also, please introduce yourselves in the chat. Feel free to tell us your name, location, and why you're here today. And you can feel free to also use the chat to engage with the rest of the attendees and panelists today as we go along. We are so excited to be here with folks from the Colorado Digital Service, the New York, or sorry, the New Jersey Office of Innovation and the New York City Mayor's Office of Chief Technology Officer for Digital Services. The challenges and opportunities of the past year have demonstrated the necessity of digital government services. And these three teams we have here today have worked innovatively to ensure that the people they serve are able to address vital needs by applying a hu human-centered lens to complex directives, guidance, and information. These teams have also helped governments become more agile in the face of uncertainty and rapidly changing circumstances. And so I am excited to learn more from these teams directly. So let's jump in. I'll have each panelist introduce yourselves with your name, location, role, and experience. And I'd love to also hear how your teams are organized and where you sit within your states and cities. Then I'll launch into a few questions that we've got prepared today. We'll have some time at the end to answer audience questions. So attendees pop them into the Q&A in Zoom. Catherine, we can start with you and can popcorn to the next person. Awesome. Thanks, Jen. Um, so excited to be here and excited for this conversation. So hello, everybody. My name is Catherine Benjamin. My pronouns are she and her. And I am the deputy CTO for digital services at the New York City Mayor's Office of the CTO. Uh, in a moment, you'll hear from my colleague, Justin, uh, and we work together in New York. Um, but first, I'll just give you a little bit of background about uh, how our office is structured and also a little bit of background on myself. Um, so for me personally, um, I've worked in a number of digital government teams. I worked in the National Health Service in the UK, um, where I was also a government digital service assessor, if you're familiar with the GDS assessment process. Um, I've also worked for the Cabinet Office in Ontario, Canada for the Ontario Digital Service, and I've worked with the governments of British Columbia and Alberta Health Services. So lots of government stuff in my uh, in my sort of history. Um, at the mayor's office of the CTO in New York, our mission is to ensure that technology is inclusive and accessible and delivers opportunity for, opportunities for all New Yorkers. And the way in which our office works as a mayoral office is we work alongside other mayoral offices and also alongside agencies um, to help use technology in, in whatever way it helps to serve New Yorkers. So our office specifically kind of has four portfolios within it. One is universal broadband, which does exactly uh, what it sounds like it does. It's very focused on making sure that broadband is available for New Yorkers. We also have tech and society that looks at things like emerging tech and IoT. We have an inclusive innovation team that looks at different business models and different types of um, moonshot challenges and collabs work we can do to foster innovation. And then finally, I work on the digital services team alongside my colleague, Justin, uh, and we're looking at things like digital products and how um, things like uh, websites or applications can help serve New Yorkers. So that's everything from me. And Jen, I'm not sure who to popcorn to next. We'll go ahead and go with Justin. 
Hey folks, uh, I'm Justin Isaac Mann. I am the Associate CTO for Digital Services in the New York City uh, Mayor's Office and the Chief Technology Officer. Uh, my day-to-day -day involves a lot of plumbing and untangling of, of technology yarn um, and supporting our digital services team, Design Lab, and the other eight teams inside the CTO's office and our partner agencies. And I will go ahead and send it over to Janelle. Hi, I am Janelle Schaefer. Uh, uh, I am with the Colorado Digital Service. Uh, my role within our team is a procurement contract and uh, budget lead. Um, uh, our office is uh, located within, uh, it's actually uh, a uh, dotted line between the governor's office and the Office of Information Technology. Um, and uh, we serve in that role, um, supporting uh, various state agencies um, regarding different technical products. And uh, since I guess we're going in the order of uh, everyone that's on each team, I'll call Michelle. Thanks, Janelle. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Michelle, and I am really excited to be here today. Um, I'm an associate product manager at Schmidt Futures, and this is a two-year rotational program for technical folks who want to use their skills in the impact space. And I was on rotation as a product manager for the Colorado Digital Service since December of last year, working on their COVID exposure notifications effort. And yeah, I will pass it over to Kai. Thanks, Michelle. Hi, everyone. My name is Kai Feeder, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Chief of Staff for New Jersey State's Office of Innovation. Um, the Office of Innovation, we're uh, a startup within government in uh, New Jersey State. We were founded in 2018 when Bessimo Novak was appointed as uh, New Jersey's first ever Chief Innovation Officer. Um, as a cabinet member, she reports directly to the governor, so we kind of are situated kind of adjacent to the governor's office, um, but I have the pleasure of working with a, uh, an array of departments and agencies across state government. Um, we're kind of like a little consulting organization and uh, technology development shop within uh, state government. Um, uh, my ba personal background uh, has been in city and state government uh, um, in the Northeast. Um, uh, most recently, prior to joining the Office of Innovation, I held a private sector role where I was doing public affairs consulting. Um, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Giuseppe Morgana, who heads up our digital work as digital director, and I'd love to pass it off to him to introduce himself. Awesome. Thanks, Guy. Um, very excited to be here and see a lot of familiar names. Um, I uh, joined uh, back in 2018 uh, when, when Beth and Kai were starting the Office of Innovation um, and very much inspired by my time at the U.S. Digital Service um, between 2015 and 2017 um, at the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, seeing how technology, um, in particular technology, when, when working alongside all of those in government can really change products and experiences for the better. Um, and so uh, our mission here is to be able to bring that same type of spirit uh, to New Jersey, where we're working alongside um, those across the government in New Jersey, um, whether it's um, whether it's working to support businesses or, or those who, who lost their job. Um, how do we bring how do we bring that those great experiences to uh, to the people of New Jersey in, in tough times? Um, so uh, excited to be here and, and excited to be on this journey in New Jersey in improving products and services and experiences. And we are so excited to have everyone here today. So the first question that I have for our three teams is that this year has highlighted the need for digital services in government. I'd love to hear some stories of how you served your communities and how COVID-19 impacted your work. What were some of the benefits and challenges you faced as a result of the pandemic? I was thinking we could start with New York. Catherine or Dustin, would you guys like to jump in? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll jump in. So I think one uh, really good example of, um, you know, in particular, why digital services can be such a powerful tool and um, really spotlighting the work that digital services teams can do is some work that we did in the spring of 2020, where we distributed 10,000 internet connected tablets to isolated older adults living in NYCHA, <clears throat> excuse me, which is New York City Housing Authority uh, buildings. So we worked together with our partners across some of those agencies that I mentioned in my introduction, some of the agencies within the city of New York, uh, and also with some of the providers of the tablets who we we're working with, and also 
also with some partners um, in in uh, who who have expertise in working with technology and older adults, and sort of how they all all of these partners coalesce together around getting this um, what was both a technical service but also a whole service design and end to end service design live and available for um, for people in a time of need. And so I think one of the things that was so powerful about that is it's the intersection of the actual thing, which is an internet connected tablet, which obviously people need the device and the connection to the internet, but also how all the different parts of the system and the government systems need to work together in order to make sure that that's seamless. So just as some small examples, things like multilingual support. We know not everyone is speaking English or English proficient. So how do you do that and make sure that all of the um, physical things that people get, like inside the box that the tablet comes in, that those instructions are available uh, in multiple languages? Um, and also how do you make sure that if someone needs help by telephone, that they can reach out to somebody in the language of their choosing. And so ultimately those were things that we were able to accommodate and build into that service design. Um, but it's an excellent example of where um, I think we can show the value of a technology project, but also how it intersects with all of these other parts um, of government and how these partnerships work um, to do something really, really impressive and actually in a really short period of time. So all in all, that whole project was really just a matter of weeks. And if you stop and think about how many components went into that system from translation to developing partnerships, to shipping and tracking devices, to onboarding people, um, I think that's that's really impressive. So uh, I think you know ultimately these opportunities that we've had to use technology in the context of COVID response have really helped people understand, wow, this is amazing what technology can do. And it's kind of raised the expectation and raised the bar of, um, of what people expect of digital government services. Justin, did I miss anything that you would like to add about that project? No, I think you covered most of it. Um, the, I'll, I'll just double down on the, uh, the fact that COVID really showed what uh, political will can enable in a process like this, where everyone is committed to delivering a product quickly and effectively, um, and and how uh, wonderful it can be to to work on a project where everyone is aligned and focused and um, excited to get to the end goal. Um, and it's amazing how quickly things can get done. Thanks for sharing that. Um, does someone want from New Jersey would like to respond? Sure, Jen, I'll go ahead and jump in here. Um, you know, prior to the pandemic, the Office of Innovation was working to advance several key initiatives, um, may, most notably on uh, the digital uh, uh, development front, uh, modernizing the delivery of workforce services and uh, digital coaching um, within the state, as well as a, a large scale initiative to make it easier to start, operate and grow a business in New Jersey. Um, and I think kind of looking back to February and March of uh, uh, 2020, um, when the pandemic hit and it became very clear that this was going to be something very permanent and very serious, um, I think that, you know, we kind of got thrown immediately into uh, crisis response mode. And um, I think that the nature of being a small, nimble organization within government um, really allowed us to, to shine at a whole nother level um, and massively expanded the, the array of agencies and departments and use cases um, where our skills could, be, uh, could, could really uh, uh, be put to use. And, you know, I, I think that there's, there's a lot to be, a lot that could be unpacked there. And I'd welcome Giuseppe to jump on in um, at any point. But, um, you know, there's something to be said about having a team that can jump in, solve a problem very quickly, and then move on to the next one. And I think that uh, it was a, a skill set in service that kind of was under uh, massive demand throughout the pandemic. And throughout, I think we've been uh, had the opportunity to prove a lot of value to a lot of new, uh, new departments and agencies uh, that we hadn't traditionally worked with. And hopefully are gonna be, uh, um, uh, be able to continue that momentum well on past the, the pandemic and, um, through recovery and beyond. Yeah, no, well said. And, and I would say we were pretty fortunate. We were about a year and a half or so old at that point. Um, and so um, because, of, because of that, because we had been interacting with different folks across the state um, and all the work that Beth and Kai were doing, um, interacting with many agencies, we weren't completely new at the stage. And so we benefited that. But I say we grew up a lot in the course of the last year. Um, I think we had a real opportunity to kind of figure out what it means to be an innovation team in New Jersey. Um, and we were doing that before, but we did it a lot faster. Um, and we were able to like really hone in on who are those partners who 
like have great visions and they were starting to work on things, but we can complement them well. And then they started to get better and know what we can do. Um, so they started pulling us in and that's the sort of trend that we're seeing. And so um, I, I do think it was, it was, um, it was a, a fascinating experience for us because it, it did allow us, I think, to grow up a lot, a lot quicker in New Jersey and, and, and help us figure out our own place in the state. And last but not least, Colorado, would you both like to chime in? Yeah, I can. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, so I think for Colorado, um, so Janelle and I were working closely on COVID exposure notifications. That was like one of the things we were doing in response to the pandemic. And for some context, this is a service on your iPhone or Android device, and it alerts you when you've been around someone who's tested positive for COVID. And I think similar to what everyone has said, um, we also saw a similar benefit in collaborations and partnerships. I think COVID was a really strong, like centralizing force for that type of hands-on collaboration. Like everyone really cared about the same problem. I think in terms of challenges, the pandemic made it really difficult for us to balance like short-term delivery and long-term sustainability. I think COVID required a really rapid response with few resources. And sometimes that meant like just getting something that worked in front of people as quickly as possible. And I don't know, I think a lot of the times the first things that get dropped are things that require a lot of time, um, like building capacity, uh, like really investigating equity. And in exposure notifications, for example, like whenever things caught on fire or broke, it was really hard to like reprioritize on like fixing our tech debt or like improving sustainability, accessibility. So I think there's a lot we can improve going forward and like setting up those kinds of structures from the beginning to make long-term investments. I'll pass it over to Janelle too. Yeah, I, I, I um, to talk even about like that more broadly, um, when we came into the COVID space, um, so much of um, everyone trying to respond at once and also not knowing what to do kind of worked to our digital services advantage. Um, our director just started showing up for meetings. Um, and, and that is actually pretty rare in government, like to get invited into the room. And so I feel like COVID-19 really allowed us to get into spaces that maybe we wouldn't have like naturally been invited to. Um, or, you know, the, the door um, wasn't quite open yet. But once we got in there, because we were able to iterate um, and deliver value really quickly, um, the door just kind of blew open. So it's like we did the first thing. Um, and that was actually not anything I was involved in at that time, even though I've been now on COVID since July, uh, my colleagues Kelly and Steph um, uh, did a ton of work to like think about what the tech structure should be. Um, in COVID response. And because that was successful, then it was like, well, can you look at this procurement? Can you look at exposure notifications? What do you think of this, like this contact tracing system? Can you do this? Can you do that? And, and like the, do the doors just kind of like open to us to be able to like really affect change and also to um, implement, I think, some practices that otherwise would have gotten some resistance. And so people were so desperate for help that things like, like user research which normally um, everyone says we don't have time for that. And I think definitely within COVID, um, you'd think that that would be the same response. But the thing is, is everything was within a deadline. And we said, well, if we can do it, will you let us do it? And they're like, well, yeah, if it's going to work, like we got to solve this immediately. And so I definitely think like where time was a challenge, it was also a benefit because it allowed us to show like how nimble we actually could be. Um, and that just like kept like bringing in new opportunities. Sorry, I didn't mute my phone. Um, that was great of me. So I just shut up. Um, and then uh, Catherine said something earlier that really resonated with me um, and, and reminded me of something that has, I feel like it's a lesson that we've learned um, and, and has really resonated with agencies that we partner with, whether public health or the Department of Labor, but like framing digital services as technology in service of dot, 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 fill in the blank. Like, yes, we always knew that that's about our communities and the people within them. But um, I feel like in agencies, what's been really impactful and how they've seen digital services differently now is they see like technology in service of public health, technology in, in, in service of 
unemployment insurance, like they see that as this incredibly supportive for, force that like makes what they do more effective and, and like helps the communities that they serve. Absolutely. Um, and so pulling on that thread a little bit, um, I was wondering if the three of the teams could also um, talk a little bit about capacity building. So, you know, one of the mottos a lot of the teams have in this space is the strategy is delivery, but we all know that capacity building is extremely important as well. Um, it'd be great if y'all could talk a little bit about why it is important to ensure that this work is sustainable and maybe give some specific examples on how you've done this on your project and teams. Um, Giuseppe, would you like to go first? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I would say in, in New Jersey, we've got a number of projects where we're fortunate to be pretty strong and longstanding partner um, with, with our agency partners. And I think one of the things we look at when we go into those projects is like, what is our role and how do we make sure we're bringing our best selves, but also we're creating the space for our partners to bring their best selves. Um, and so I think we think a little bit about how do we create this safe space, sometimes for a new culture, like to be able to iterate and build product in new way. Now we're not, we, we wanna make sure there's space to bring all of our partners expertise, right? Like all of that to the table, but then use like our like fortunate place and, and some of the air cover we're able to create. So we can create a, say, a space for us to apply that expertise in new ways that we know create great products, going back to like user research, putting the user at the center of everything we're doing. Um, and to do that and creating that safe space, I think we approach it um, very much like we approach products. Um, how do we iteratively change the culture? So not just um, like come in and say, there's gonna be a whole new thing, but instead, how do you start small, bring the folks who are passionate about this way of working or just trying something new and say, we're gonna like start with a small team. We're going to try to address a problem together and we're gonna scope it re really small, but we're gonna try to get wins and like get back to that point of, uh, of shipping product and showing what it means because that's what changes like the perspective. Like a lot of folks, when we talk to them, they're expecting sometimes to see things in six months, a year plus with a long requirements gathering. But if we can pick a small thing and show how we just shipped it and then they gave us feedback and we put it in, that this is a fundamentally new way of working. And over time, um, I think what we found is like that iterative way of like just showing people and bringing them along and bringing more and more people into that over time is the way to be able to actually create that, that lasting change without taking away all that is good about government and the experiences that folks have. And so um, what, I, what I would say is it's incredibly important uh, to make sure we're, we're really diligent and thoughtful about how we do that. Um, and, and the only way we do that is if we bring everybody along uh, on the journey. Um, but Kai, Kai, I don't know if you have anything to add for the New Jersey experience. No, but I see Catherine has her, has her hand raised. Yeah, go ahead, Catherine. Um, awesome. Yeah, so I'd love to jump on that culture change thread a bit. Um, one of the things um, that uh, somebody in Canada, if you're familiar with any of Honey Dak and I's blogs, though I'm sure others say it as well, um, you know, she often talks about the watchers versus the doers. Um, and so that isn't just to be clear, it doesn't suggest that people are standing on the sidelines doing nothing and watching. That's not what it means. It means that sort of people who have the technical skill sets to scrub in on projects um, versus those who uh, maybe have a different skill set. And so I remember when I was in cabinet office, one of the questions I posed um, and also eventually figured out the answer to was how many people, just for example, do we have in this organization of 60,000 people who can conduct a user research interview and turn that into a prototype in the next day? It doesn't have to be a perfect prototype. I just mean that ability to execute something and turn it around. And to Giuseppe's point around culture change, um, the, the doer's way of working, that's a culture change where uh, it, what we're trying to do is make tangible as quickly as possible so that we can align people around a product vision. Uh, the worst thing we can do in, in times of um, uncertainty is to speak too much, which is dangerous because I talk a lot. Anyone who knows me knows that. Um, but you want something that people can actually interact with because until it's tangible, um, I often give the example that if we were to all close our eyes right now and imagine a house with many windows located on a hill, 
we'd all be imagining something different. And if we then asked construction worker to build it, we'd all end up with very different houses with windows on hills. One isn't necessarily better than the other, but I can tell you that it's not the same thing. Um, and so, you know, I think when we talk about the strategy as delivery, part of it is about getting to this culture of making things as quickly as possible and validating them with evidence. If users don't like it, well, you've only spent two days working on it, throw it away and build something else. Um, and that's a pretty fundamental shift because historically in government, we don't have tons of makers or, or doers. We, we tend to have uh, less technical skill sets. Um, and that's, of course, changing over time. Um, but that's a hard one to pivot on a bit. Um, I know also, though, that Justin probably wants to jump in a little bit uh, to talk about technical debt. So Justin, why don't I hand it over to you? Uh, sure, uh, I can be really quick. Uh, I think Kai, Michelle, and Janelle all talked about being nimble so that we can deliver whatever's needed whenever it's needed. Um, in our office, we partner almost exclusively with uh, other agencies and departments to help them deliver their stuff. And if we're not building capacity in those teams, we end up maintaining the products that we're building. And over time, the ability of us to be nimble to versus maintaining that stuff, it, that, that balance really changes. And so in order for us to stay nimble, we have to build capacity in our partners and throughout government in order for them to take on and grow the work that we help launch and start and we'll be there to just start with them, get them to their first prototype, show what's possible, do that culture change, but we need to make sure that we're, build, we're building capacity so that they can take on that work and we're able to stay nimble and rather, rather than being a maintenance organization. Michelle or Janelle, would you like to pipe in as well? Um, I, I would just like briefly say, because I know we're, um, we have so many questions and so many or so so little time, but um, I think there's also something to be said for um, you know when we talk about capacity building uh, and and having those you know what Catherine said about having somebody that can actually conduct user research or you know you know like any of those types of items. Um, I, I think that that's really, really uh, puts a huge burden on a digital service team and did in the pandemic, at least for Colorado, to do everything um, because some of those skill sets aren't there. Um, and that's not to like say that um, anything against our partners. I, I actually think, right, like this is a brand new world for them. And so we're trying to like bring them along for the journey. <laughs> while we're also trying to deliver and iterate quickly. And, and that can be a really, really tough balance. It's like, how do you get something done really fast and then also teach someone so that they can carry it on? And, and um, we in Colorado still every single day, I think, I think it is a constant struggle for us where we're always asking that question because the worst thing that could possibly happen is we right, deliver quickly and, and it's of great value. And then the work doesn't get carried forward and it dies. Um, and, and then what happens there is then folks say like, oh, this model doesn't work. This doesn't, we, we can't do this because look, it failed when really, if you, if you get to like the heart of what that problem is, it's there's no one there to carry it forward. And so how do you teach? How do you also bring in additional resources? Like what kind of funding do you find? All of those things to make it sustainable and make it last longer than just your engagement. Yeah, I love Janelle's point on this and also Justin, your point about bringing people along. I think to build sustainably, I remember we relied really heavily on the knowledge of people who had been like working in Colorado much longer than us. Um, and I think especially at a state like the technical infrastructure is really, really complex with like decades of history behind it. And I just could not navigate it alone. Um, so. I remember like needing to get as much institutional knowledge as possible, like leaning on state developers who had been there for a long time. Um, and for exposure notifications, we were like constantly going back and forth with senior state developers, um, especially because they will be maintaining it long term. I think another thing we really tried to do, but still haven't really like perfected is trying to adapt like agile and pro product practices that are sustainable to work in government. I remember like attending a like really engaging agile training like at the state with other product people um, from the government and the instructors were talking about like rapid iteration like you know you got to pivot on user feedback um, and I remember like a lot of us in the audience being like wow like this is really really great but how how can we take something like rapid iteration and then apply it in government 
for example, it's just like really, really difficult to fail fast when it can take like more than a month to get access to a single data source. And I think that product techniques that work in the private sector, there's a lot of opportunity and room for improvement in adapting it to the government. Um, so yeah, I think at the core, the pandemic, it changed the urgency with which we were building and it also opened a lot of doors but I don't think it really like, revolutionized the like technical environment we were building in. These are all really great points. Um, and I wanna kind of touch on, um, you know, things that everyone here was hinting at, which is the firefighting. So, you know, on the flip side of that capacity building, we always have to balance um, capacity building and firefighting. And I wanna, sort of talk about the darker side of this work, which can come from being seen as techno saviors or people parachuting in to solve an issue. Um, and we all know this leads to burnout culture. So how have you combated this on your teams? And what do you think would be needed to create more resilient teams, um, you know, digital service or innovation teams in the future? Does someone from New York want to go first? Sure, I can take this. Uh, and I think it's going to be a similar comment. If we uh, aren't building capacity in teams, we're always going to be the ones parachuting in. And so, because there's not someone else to jump in on it. Um, and so we're called in to fix something. And so, and one of the interesting things that this leads to is the more successful we are, the more the expectations change. Um, and so uh, if we do something really quick, this one time, the expectation is we should just be able to do it real quick the next time and the next time and the next time. Um, and we're not uh, coming in and building that capacity and taking the time to do it right. Um, and it's actually really interesting to look at the digital maturity of different organizations and different cities and the effect that digital teams like ours can have on the, the perception of a city or a state. Um, so a digital team that can come in and deliver something flashy or fix a problem really quickly um, can make people think that the entire city or state is digitally mature and therefore doesn't necessarily need the investment or the time or the capacity building um, to level up everyone because we, we're, we're already doing it. Uh, Colorado, New Jersey, like we all look to them as these paragons of, thing, of, of groups that have figured it out. Um, but anyone who works in it knows that we haven't quite figured it out and there's a lot of uh, capacity building and leveling up that can, we, we can do. So the more fires we fight and the more successful we are, sometimes the more we set an expectation that can be dangerous for us in the long term in terms of delivering organizational wide uh, digital maturity and capacity. So um, I don't know if I have a, a deeper point there other than um, you know, we want to do the good work, but as if we're not building, if, if all we're doing is firefighting and all we're doing is setting an expectation, um, we need to be leveling that up. I cannot agree with Justin Moore. I think also you run into this really dangerous challenge where digital service becomes firefighting and, and like working in this way becomes firefighting. So it's like something has to be on fire and that's when you call in the digital service. And, 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 and right, like that part of it can be really, really, um, oh gosh, it just, it always worries me, I think. And I've seen it a lot in the pandemic where rather than thinking we should change the way we work and, and we should bring this in early and often. And, and this should be a methodology that we follow like iteration, user research, it's, wait until it is literally like the house is on fire and it is burning down and that's the team you call in. Let's hire a team that does that. And, and that is like a strange um, place to be. And so by re-emphasizing capacity building and putting while you're firefighting, also saying like, you know, like sharing with folks that this is actually a way to work, not just when your house is on fire, but to build your house initially, like all of those types of things, like um, it's, it's just so important. Um, in order to make this actually stick and, and for the culture to change. I'll just jump in here for to kind of build on that a little bit because I think that, you know, the, the firefighting component of it, um, going back to kind of the early days of the pandemic, as Giuseppe pointed out, like we were around as a team in New Jersey um, and working with kind of select number of departments and agencies, but the firefighting skills kind of 
you know, for lack of a better term, give us the stripes that we uh, we needed to give us the rank to eventually set our own course and now have much more of a broader mandate. And I think a, a little more cachet within state government um, to be able to kind of move weight around a little bit. And I think part of this also comes from the fact of uh, um, when you think about the, the, the various kind of elements in the recipe or ingredients in the recipe, air cover is a huge part of it. You know, there's this stuff is, is, is not easy to do. Um, there's a lot of culture clash. And I think that having having a team positioned within government in a place where you understand that there's a mandate behind what you're trying to do. You're not just kind of coming in and um, you know needling around to then jump back out and go to the next fire, but like, hey, we're gonna be working on this for a couple of years, right? Um, uh, and that the, there, there really does need to be a kind of sustainable approach and model. And um, uh, in the longer term, uh, you know, it takes a long time to set these, to set these teams up and, and kind of build the relationships get that cachet to be able to do this work and be respected for it along the way, as opposed to just being someone that can, you know, come in and stand up a website in a few days, whereas otherwise it would have taken a month or so. Um, I think to Kai's point of, of like the demand of firefighting, I'll just point out the difference between urgent and important um, and how unfortunately urgent things often take precedence over important things. Um, and as we've come out of the pandemic, the importance of shifting your focus from, oh yeah, we can fix that, but we should really do this thing. Um, and that pressure of how do you not get distracted by something that is on fire, but is not necessarily as important as doing the long-term building and work and setting up the dominoes to, to really build and deliver on a good government strategy and to Janelle's point of not just becoming a firefighting team. I think one, one question that I've had that I'd love to hear how other states have dealt with is how to build resilience as people like roll on and off teams. I think in Colorado, at least like we have a lot of state employees and volunteers like who are on a shared services model. So they'll come in and there's a lot of incentive to like just deploy in the short term before you go. Um, and there's also a lot of knowledge loss that happens as people roll off. And I think it's really important to try to incentivize people to make sure they like invest in the next person who takes their place. But sometimes it's not possible, like you have to roll off on immediate notice. And yeah, how have you thought about like making sure your work is sustainable for the next person? I'm just smiling because I'm thinking about writing documentation and I would be interested to know how much time people spent wrote writing documentation <laughs> as part of crisis response. It's really difficult to like, that's a classic one that it's maybe, I don't know that anyone particularly loves doing it, uh, but it really needs to be done. But great example of something that's easy to get behind on uh, and makes it harder for the next person to maintain it. And I think it's as there's both the individual projects and then there's the like, taking time to like document lessons learned, do an after action report and give folks the space to realize what we just went through. Um, I think it's easy to jump to the next thing um, and the firefighting, right? There's, there's going to be another fire always. Uh, I, I, the way that I think we're thinking about it now in New Jersey is as folks transition subject areas or different projects and agencies, um, how do we take that time to do the after action report in a way that it is not only, again, not just our team, but all of the partners and collect the feedback from the different folks who are involved in the project. And to me, that's a bit about creating some sustainability in terms of how did we approach this? Why did we make this decision? Why did we go down this route? Um, how can we take that and next time when we see the pattern again, all feel like we've had a shared experience. And sometimes the individual people will change, but I think the lessons learned, I think will can can transcend an individual project. Um, and so that that's, it's not a uh, building on Catherine's point, it's not a perfect answer, but I think after action reports and creating the space and time for that uh, could serve as part of that journey to iterate your way towards more sustainable uh, projects and not just the firefighting. If I can just add one tiny thing um, to this, um, and, and I know we, we need to move on, but um, 
two of my colleagues actually did an exercise this year. Um, hearing this, like it reminded me of it. I'm um, Karen Lou and Stephanie Kane, where they went back and they actually interviewed everyone that we've worked with over the last year. Um, and, and so like, remember like things come before, like government was here before you, it'll be there after you and, and things move on, right? And so even though we're not talking to them anymore, um, or like in a day-to-day -day cadence or, or contributing to their project, like it went somewhere. And, and the feedback that we actually got from those like former clients, former partners, you know, former collaborators about what our impact was or where it fell down and, and what was working or wasn't working was one of the most valuable things for our team. Because we literally could see, you know, after we had left where, you know, or not even after we had left, but just what we had done and reflect on it more in the, like from the lens of someone else who's experiencing it um, in government at the same time as us, but in a different way. And also like what their individual challenges are. So um, just like a, a slight plug there for that work because I can't say enough how valuable it was to our team and rethinking how we approach our projects and which projects we even take on, right? Like something could be really high priority, but, um, if we don't have the ability to actually uh, impact change for the long term, um, maybe it's not for us. And, and that could be because of our size, right? Like some digital services teams, a lot of them, when they start, they're small and they're scrappy. And we have to be really careful when we pick um, what we're working on to make sure that like what, you know, the, the culture that we're trying to share can stick as well as the um, methodology and, and, you know, the ways of working. Thanks for that. So we've just talked about how your teams do this work and more of the operational side of things, but I'd love to switch gears a little bit and dig into the why and the impact that this work has on the communities that we serve. So if you can speak to me a little bit as to how user research and community design has been a part of your work um, and how you bring that in uh, to add value to the government services. Um, does someone from New York want to start? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love talking about user research. So, I mean, I'll first talk just at a high level about it and then give a specific example in New York. So whenever I talk about user research um, or user-centered design, I like to point out that um, one of the things you'll notice is that um, in government service design and healthcare service design, we talk about user-centered design as though it's this like really easy and neutral thing to do. Um, but to give an example from when I worked in healthcare, if you have patient-centered design um, and it's it's being led by patients, it therefore isn't being led by the system. You can't have two people leading, like ultimately some trade-offs have to happen. And this is where a lot of this culture change becomes uncomfortable. So specifically when you're doing product design, how do you resolve these tensions between what you hear in a user research interview and what maybe somebody put in 18 month strategic plan if, you know, as occasionally it happens, they're maybe not perfectly aligned. Those become these like really, really difficult things that we encounter as we try to operationalize user research at scale. Or when you find that you're testing your feature and turns out users don't like it. it I guarantee it will happen to you. And if it hasn't happened to you, it means you haven't done enough user research. Um, it's a very sweaty and uncomfortable feeling because you're sitting there talking to a user and thinking, ah, the last two weeks of work isn't actually proving what we thought it was going to prove. Um, and so how you respond to that as, as an organization is you know, some of the culture change stuff that we've been speaking about. Um, but I think we also talked about, I think Janelle mentioned this, that as we're moving quickly in designing products, um, especially in the context of COVID, uh, user research is easy to leave behind. Um, it is very time consuming if anyone's um, set up the logistics of user research and particularly in organizations where they haven't historically been doing tons of user research. As you first set it up, there's like a, there's a big hill to overcome. And once you've set up that infrastructure, you can do it a lot more um, seamlessly. Um, but going back to this example of the 10K tablets project, I remember, um, we were moving so fast that you know there was this question can we even do user research uh, how would we even do it this quickly um and i think we became like quite close got, got really close to thinking this isn't going to be possible 
Uh, but we did it. And I like to tell this story because not only did we do it, not only did it give us tremendous insight into um, how the users were responding to receiving these tablets, um, but also just as an organization um, or an organizational change perspective, people loved hearing um, the, the outcomes of that user research. So we had the mayor read some quotes uh, that we had consent to share um, at a press conference. Um, and so I often talk about user research as one of those things where it's really difficult to do. And then when it's done, every Everyone is incredibly happy that it has happened, um, but that's kind of a difficult arc to get through. Um, and that assumes that you don't have the, the thing that does happen a lot, which is you might find that what the user said doesn't align with someone's vision for something. And that's totally normal. That's totally to be expected. If you've never had that happen, then it means you're not doing enough user research, but it doesn't uh, make it easy if your organization is trying to look for reasons to not do user research. They'll, con they'll consider that a reason to, to sort of shut it down rather than embrace it. So um, hugely important. Love to hear what some of the other, and particularly Colorado, uh, with your procurement, how, how you used user research in that sense. <laughs> The part of user research during the pandemic response, um, or the way we applied it, that I think is really interesting, outside of procurement, which is, I, you think that I would want to talk about procurement because that's my thing, but um, it was actually, there was, like, as much as people came together to work together, there was also, um, just based on the historical uh, context of relationships, a lot of broken trust between local level government and state government. And so um, the local level government had felt very let, let down by our um, public health uh, at the state so many times that they weren't even willing to trust them with, you know, uh, being the leader uh, on deploying technology. And, and I, I really, when it comes to user research, it was what saved that relationship. And so um, our UX designer and research lead, uh, Steph Kane, and, and uh, she did an ungodly amount of work for such a tight timeline, but I'll never forget, um, she had done, you know, all of this research and work with the local level and, and um, then asked for feedback on it. And they said, you heard us, that's my voice. And that was such a cool moment because they had never felt that about the state before. Um, and, and this was before, right? Like we had done anything. It was just literally <laughs> documenting to a certain degree what they were trying to say and, and what they needed um, at the local level in order to respond to the pandemic. And so um, I, I guess I would just say like, it, it is to me what I've learned since I've joined this team, the most powerful way to build relationships, which are the very foundation to being successful with a digital service, because you are giving a voice so often to folks that don't feel that they have any voice. Also, you are showing how you can apply that to technology and make it meaningful. Thanks. And I know we're um, just about ready to wrap up. So before I jump into the last question, which is actually a two-parter, I do want to encourage um, the folks listening in today to go into the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom and add any questions you may have or upvote um, any of the ones that are currently there that you'd like. Um, and so finally, for this last question, can you share one, what you see on the horizon for digital services and government, realistically given where we are today? And two, what would you ideally like to see happen for this work? So say you had a magic wand, um, what would you use that magic wand to do? Um, does someone from New Jersey want to go first? I'm happy to. Um, I would say in terms of where we're going and what happened, I think that they're, they're actually related in this case. Um, I, I think we're seeing a lot of movement towards increased state and local teams. Uh, forming across the country with a lot of support coming from a lot of different places. Um, and I have experienced, uh, as we have grown in New Jersey, the fact that there is such a rich ecosystem of other states and locals, local teams, as well as the federal teams that we can reach out to for guidance support, like not, not having to reinvent the wheel, um, has made our ability to have impact so much greater. And so as I see this going, my hope is that that same sense of community continues as we grow, um, because I think what that will do is we're going to start to see X number of team is going to be much more efficient, hopefully, at getting started, because you're going to learn from the lessons of all the things that we did wrong um, or all the, the, the like quick failures, right, and like the lessons that we learned along the way. Um, and so for me, I, I am hoping that we see a strong community around all of these state and local teams that are forming. 
um, and that we can find ways to be able to lift each other up um, and support each other as we're as we're working through um, each of our individual journeys and each of the things that makes each of us special. Um, so at the same time, being able to to, uh, to to leverage all of those those wider lessons. So that would that would be my uh, two part answer. Thanks, Gitsupdi. Um, someone from New York. Yes, um, I can go ahead and take that one. Um, so if I were to sort of predict the future um, or sort of one of the things that I think will, um, you know, come up on our horizon is, um, this is kind of a boring answer that we hear all the time, but I think constituents increasingly are expecting their government services to align with their expectation of other types of digital services, an e-commerce or a banking style experience. So increasingly, they're going to be more vocal um, and have higher expectations around that. So, um, so I think we'll start to see sort of ever more spotlighting of those digital services. And if I could wave a magic wand to sort of respond to those raised ex expectations, I would, I don't know how I would describe this to my um, fairy godmother in my request in the scenario, but it's providing both the not so much the technical infrastructure though that's important too but also the organizational infrastructure so i gave the example of user research a moment ago um there's things within organizations and if you've worked in in places like you know the government digital service in the uk there is such an ecosystem of solved problems components templates that are solved that you can hit the ground and sprint so fast. Um, you know, they have literally prototyping kits. Um, those are the types of things that when we can stop um, always starting from, you know, zero and having to build bespoke things and actually start to have more of those reusable components, that's where, um, you know, you can actually see the scale and avoid a lot of the tech debt. Um, not permanently, but I mean, in the absence of that, we sort of spin up quickly and then we hit the tech debt later on. And in this case, you can kind of like bypass some of that. So some of these, uh, the great thing about the sort of thing I'd be asking my fairy godmother for is that many of it has already been done and is open and available. And, you know, you see this in digital government circles and people swapping, um, you know, examples or good, good practice. And, you know, the Beck Center has been trying to consolidate a lot of that um, so that you don't have to hunt for it. It's sort of all in one space. Um, but I think that's the thing that isn't the shiniest or like biggest wow factor. And I think it's difficult for people to even put their finger on until they don't have it. Um, some of you maybe have heard me describe it as like, it's like having the absence of gravity. Um, the difference between having gravity or not having gravity, you can't quite put your finger on it, but you definitely notice the difference. Um, that I think would be sort of uh, the game changer. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the New York perspective. Can I can I add one other magic wand request? Um, carrying on from Catherine's more digital, there will be more digital in the future, not less, and the expectation will be higher, not lower. Um, I would love to be able to. Right now, government has a monopoly on the delivery of government services, and so there's very little pressure to do user research and be metrics driven. Um, because you have to come to us to pay taxes. You have to come to us to get SNAP benefits. You have to come to us to get unemployment benefits. And so there's not the same pressures. So run data-driven experiments because you can't go somewhere else. Um, so if, my magic, if I had a magic wand, I would change that incentive structure so that governments were more responsive or, or, and, and more pushed by the need to deliver a good service rather than a need to deliver a service. Um, yeah. And in the interest of time, we've got two questions in the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, the first one that's been top voted, which is, what is a technology that is not available to the public sector that needs to become available to power the digital services that citizens need? Is, does anyone here want to take that? I don't think it's necessarily one particular technology. I think that there's a challenge of procuring uh, consumer technologies. Um, and so uh, I think it's I think it's just a challenge with procurement as many challenges in government are is we'll always be slightly hampered in our acquisition of technology by procurement processes and rules and policies, which are all intended for very good reasons, but the combination often works against us. I can build off of that a little bit just from um, understanding very uh, 
cheaply how painful procurement is. Um, there are so many incredible technologies out there that we will never, ever, 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 ever get to access in the public sector because of terms and conditions. And I, I like it, it's heartbreaking, actually, because some of them are things that we don't even think about in our everyday individual lives. It's just human beings that um, are not uh, in our, our line of work um, that we literally are not allowed to use in government because somewhere in a tech company's T's and C's, there is like, you know, I call them like the deadly six, but there are these six things that if they if they touch them in, in their standard T's and C's, like government cannot do business with you, even if it's free, which is so sad. Like you could give it to us. And because we have to agree to your terms, we can't use it. And, and so I, I like, I have to emphasize, like, I don't think it's like one technology that if we had it, it's like, if we could break down that barrier, um, and and I, I feel like I've had some success with that a couple of times, but it's rare and it happens few and far in between. But I wish that the private sector could understand some of it's codified in law, too. It's not even something where we're being, you know, ridiculous. Like it, there's a statute somewhere that says we cannot agree to indemnify ourselves against X, Y and Z or we cannot agree to your jurisdiction. And so that would be my I guess I got to say my magic wand after all. Um, I wish that that would go away and I wish somebody could meet us there on it because um, it, it would open up so many possibilities if we just could get through like some legalese <laughs> that is incredibly difficult and painful. That is such a good point uh, that like cuts so deep. Um, the next question that we have um, from one of our attendees is, has each of your states invested significantly more time and effort in developing private public partnerships during COVID? What specific initiatives have provided the greatest ROI in terms of forming these partnerships? Does someone from New Jersey wanna take that? Yeah, and I, I could talk, um, give two, quick examples, uh, one, one which is um, with another um, nonprofit or with a, with a nonprofit organization. The other actually, I'm gonna expand upon the question and actually talk about partnership across government a little bit more. Um, the first one was um, New Jersey worked with the Federation of American Scientists. Um, early on in the first weeks of the pandemic, um, we actually, um, the Federation of American Scientists made available um, a resource to be able to answer lots of questions that were coming in from the public with regard to COVID. Um, and you remember at that time, like the answers were changing what was seemingly like by the minute. Um, and so they stood up um, to be able to get journalists and scientists to be able to answer those questions to the public. Um, and what we did in New Jersey is when we stood up our COVID19.nj.gov page to try to create a, a central resource for New Jerseyans to find out information about, about uh, COVID-19 and the response to COVID-19, um, what we did was we worked with our agencies to create agency-specific information, and we worked with the Federation of American Scientists to create an automatic feed to have all of their questions and answers actually populate our nj.gov site. And what that did was it allowed our state to focus on what are the specific things that our state is giving guidance around, like the new policies we were putting in place. Um, and so it was, to me, it was a wonderful partnership in the sense that it allowed us to be our best selves. It allowed us to focus more specifically on the stuff that was unique to New Jersey and get all of that benefit of live science, scientists and journalists providing responses to COVID-19 questions. So that, that partnership, I think, was quite powerful in terms of being able to give um, the people of New Jersey um, a, a great resource um, while allowing us to make sure we were focusing on what was unique to New Jersey. Um, and the other just quick thing I'll mention here is, um, the pandemic also provided an opportunity here in New Jersey for us to partner with the U.S. Digital Service on um, a portion of the, our unemployment insurance certification process. Um, and it was really a unique opportunity for us to be able to, to, to combine forces um, in a way that I don't think happens very often with, with the feds and states um, working together this closely. Um, and I thought it was quite powerful. Um, and so I think just generally, um, the more we can find partnerships, the more we can create space for experts to be able to contribute um, th their best selves, I think the better off we will all be. Um, and so I think the the, the uh, pandemic provided a couple of opportunities for us to do that. And I think we would look to continue that, that trend in the future. Thank you so much.
Lovely. Um, so I do want to close out by saying thanks to our panelists for their expertise and insights this hour and a shout out to Riley Martin and Sarah Scott Rodriguez, two of our Beck Center researchers who pulled this event together behind the scenes. Um, we do have a bunch of things um, and events coming up at the Beck Center, which I'll share the link in the chats for. Um, the Beck Center is launching a digital fundamentals for public impact course, which starts in July. We're going to be partnering with the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University to offer this course. We're also actively working with local and state governments on the American Rescue Plan and have put together a set of resources for folks to leverage. And lastly, we're building a professional association for technologists that serve the public good and are holding a town hall next week on Thursday to build this community together. Lastly, keep an eye out for a blog post coming from the Colorado Digital Service on their learnings from exposure notifications. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining and coming today. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day.